with you and, uh, and I welcome you all for the online uh, meeting of Kerala State and this is our uh, 11th one uh, this year and started in January. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the, the presence of uh, national president and national secretary with us. We are privileged to have them. And uh, we have the coordinators, uh, Dr. Vijish, Dr. Rajesh, uh, Dr. Binil, and uh, with them, our national president uh, is also a coordinator of this course. Uh, and uh, today's speakers, uh, you all know that uh, Dr. E.K. Ramdas, the senior most uh, uh, faculty in Kerala, and is very well known. He's from uh, uh, Baby Memorial Hospital, and he will be speaking on uh, uh, on perioperative renal protection. And also, we have the PGs in the PG session. Uh, we have from the PGs from MIMS uh, to moderate them. Uh, we have. Uh, their uh, head of the department, Dr. Kishore, with us. For the official uh, welcome, uh, I call upon our uh, president, Dr. Shamsad Begum, uh, to welcome you. Thank you. Over to you, madam. Okay, uh, Paul. Uh, respected national president, Dr. Begidagiri, our national secretary, Dr. Naveen Malhotra, our State Secretary, Dr. Paul, uh, our academic coordinators, Dr. Rajesh, Vijesh, and Binil, in all, uh, and uh, all our senior ISA uh, members, as well as the other ISA members, dear friends, colleagues, and the postgraduate students. A warm good evening, as well as a warm welcome for all of you to this, our 11th academic program. So today's academic program will be presented by uh, Dr. E.K. Ramdas. He doesn't require any introduction to any of us, as well as he is a well-known uh, faculty for all of our academic programs, as well as the CMEs. And he is from the Baby Memorial Hospital, and he is the head of the Department of Anesthesiology in Baby Memorial Hospital. I welcome you, sir, for this program. And today's PG corner is from the PGs of, from the MIMS Calicut. And they are uh, will, they will be presenting Rocuronium by Najita as well as the equipment pulse oximeter by Arthira Anil. And it will be chaired by uh, Dr. Kishore, the HOD of uh, Department of Anesthesiology at MIMS Hospital Calicut. I welcome you all for this program once again. Okay, um, now I invite now uh, our national president, Dr. Vengadagiri, for the uh, inauguration of this program. Thank you, President Dr. Shamsad, National Secretary Dr. Naveen, State Secretary Paul, Past Secretary Vinil, Coordinators uh, Dr. Rajesh and Vijish, uh, today's faculties uh, Dr. Ramda sir and uh, Coordinate, uh, moderator Kishore, PGs, senior members, uh, friends. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, as routine, uh, the alternate Saturday, we are having this academic program of Kerala. And this time we have Dr. Ramdas, who is well-known faculty and uh, uh, gives a lot of talks on renal transplant. I think today also we have, uh, he is, I mean, uh, he is uh, giving the talk on uh, uh, renal uh, uh, preservation. So I don't want to talk much, but uh, I have uh, our secretary, Dr. Naveen, uh, with me here in Calcutta today. I wish uh, he will uh, say a few words uh, and uh, uh, talk to you all. It is a privilege uh, for having uh, Naveen with us all today. Yeah. He will just, uh, I will give the seat to Naveen. Naveen will join. Good evening, all, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, during the mm -hmm. Kerala postgraduate update. And as Dr. Giri has rightly said, it has been going on since almost now 
more than two and a half years or so. And it was uh, started during COVID and Benil uh, has continued uh, even after completing his term as secretary and Dr. Paul and Madam have taken it to further heights. And I wish uh, all the participants both on the organizing side and on the attending side, a good luck and uh, and pay my regards to the very senior faculty, Dr. Ramdas sir, who shall be delivering an important talk today. I won't be standing between you and the academics. Let the academics flow. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Menil. Thank you, sir. Uh... Over to Dr. Rajesh for uh, introducing the faculties and topic. Thank you, Dr. Binil. It's a great uh, honor and privilege to have my uh, Chodi Ramda sir here. And uh, sir is uh, well known in, uh, in all academic forums in India. And uh, sir has uh, been a faculty for the anesthesia conference of, for the last 30 years. And sir, is, uh, he was been in a government service for a short while before coming to uh, major institutions in Calicut and uh, sir is the past uh, state president of ISA Kerala and is a patron of ISA Calicut city branch is an excellent orator and teacher and uh, it's a privilege to have him here uh, over to Ramda sir Ramda sir okay please. thank you thank you Rajesh thank you thank you for that introduction I must congratulate the team for organizing such uh, updates. Uh, it's a, uh, actually a, a difficult task, you know, which is going on for quite some time now. I'm also happy that uh, Dr. Giri and uh, Naveen are uh, there, you know, to listen to this sitting in uh, Calcutta in front of uh, ISA banner. So I'm really happy about that. So uh, shall I share my screen now? Yes, sir, please. Is that okay? Yes, sir. It's visible. Thank you. So today, uh, I shall uh, start off with the topic. Uh, we are going to discuss on perioperative acute kidney, in kidney injury and its prevention. Acute kidney injury is something that uh, we see almost every day. Uh, it is something that uh, you are going to encounter uh, in your professional life almost every day. It is something that we take for granted. We don't bother about it. We are worried about something, you know, happens on the table, which is evident clinically, like, you know, cardiac problem or a respiratory problem. But when it happens to the kidneys, we don't much attend to it. That is a real uh, uh, bad thing about it. So the topic is going to be perioperative renal protection. So I shall present this topic under the following headings. Uh, working definition of acute kidney injury, <clears throat> acute kidney injury risk identification, its prevention, and something about the biomarkers which are coming up, and uh, a take-home message. Uh, the, by definition, acute kidney injury uh, is acute, means abrupt, abrupt loss of kidney function. There is retention of urea and other indigenous waste products. And there is a dysregulation of extracellular volume and electrolytes. That is the definition of acute kidney injury. Before I proceed further, I would like to define some of the terms which we commonly come across during our practice. That is, one is creatinine, another is blood urea nitrogen or the BUN, and the third one is oliguria, and last, the anuria. So these are the terms which we very commonly use during our day-to-day -day practice and what it really means to us. Creatinine, we all know that it is a breakdown product of creatine phosphate muscle. It is completely filtered by the kidneys. And therefore, it is used to estimate kidney function and also filtration. It is inversely proportional to the function of the kidneys. That means the higher the creatinine value, the lower is the filtration. 
coming to the next uh, term that we commonly use is the BUN, BUN, uh, blood urea nitrogen. It is formed from protein catabolism in the liver. It is filtered by kidney and it is used as an additional measure of kidney function. High BUN normally reflects lower filtration. But there are some caveats uh, regarding this that BUN can increase independent of kidney function. So you have a, can have a patient with normal kidney function, but an abnormal blood urea nitrogen. This can happen during steroid intake. It can happen during tetracycline intake, or it can happen when there is bleed in the gastrointestinal tract. So you cannot totally believe on this, uh, this value. Coming to the next definition, what is oliguria? Oliguria is defined commonly as uh, when the urine output is more less than 0 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour in the adult. And a child weighing less than 10 kg it is defined as urine less than 1 ml per kg per hour. That is the definition for oliguria. And anuria is often defined as urine less than 100 ml per 24 hours. So these are the definitions which we commonly come across during uh, when we talk about acute kidney injury. Now, there are several definitions to acute kidney injury, more than 35 definitions in literature. That means that not a single one is proper, adequately explained. So if you have too many uh, definitions, then it is very difficult to, control, uh, to conduct a trial because uh, the definitions vary from, uh, def from person to the, from uh, group to group. So there is very, uh, it's a very difficult thing to uh, uh, understand as far as the uh, trials are concerned. So what is acute? Uh, kidney injury. Uh, there, the, 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 the generations, maybe 10 or 20 years back, we used to use the term acute renal failure, but the preferred terminology now is acute kidney injury. Why is it called acute kidney injury? Because it is acute, that it is abrupt. That means abrupt is happening within hours of uh, two days. It is kidney and not renal because that is a term which we commonly use, even the lay people know about it, kidney. So it's more familiar and then we use kidney. It is injury and not failure. When we say failure, then it refers to total shutdown. So you cannot use the word failure and therefore that is changed to injury. So the actual the term has changed from acute renal failure to acute kidney injury. And now coming to uh, coming talking about the definitions of acute kidney injury, there are several definitions that said, told you already. In 2004, the Acute Dialysis and Quality Initiative, they defined acute kidney injury based on the creatinine, the urine, the glomerular filtration rate, and they came out with what is called the rifle uh, classification, which I'm not going into the details. And in 2007, the acute kidney injury network, they also came out with a definition uh, based on the same thing, same uh, creatinine and urine. And in lastly, 2012, 2012, that is most recent, the kidney disease improving global outcomes. Uh, they defined it based on the creatinine and urine. Both, all the definitions are based on creatinine and urine, but what we follow at present is the key DIGO definitions of definition of acute kidney injury. So what according to that, what is acute kidney injury? So according to that, there are three, it can be defined in three ways. It can be, it could be either increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 or more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours, or it could be increase in serum creatinine by 1.5 times baseline. For example, if the patient is one at the beginning and at the end of the surgery, if the patient is 1.5, that is significant. Or if the patient is 1.2 at the beginning of the surgery and if the patient is 1.5 at the end of the surgery, that is significant. Or the urine volume less than 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour for six hours. 
this again is very confusing because perioperative period, the urine output can uh, uh, reduce tremendously because of various reasons. Talk about it later on. So now, uh, GFR and creatinine. Uh, so if you look at this graph, all this graph is, uh, is similar in all definitions. So as <clears throat> the creatinine increases, the GFR falls. You can see here between one and two milligram per deciliter of creatinine, there is a tremendous decrease in GFR. GFR has fallen from 120 to almost 40 when the creatinine has fallen down uh, to one and two. But if you look at this graph, uh, between nine and 10 creatinine uh, milligram per deciliter, the fall in GFR is not much, it is not very significant, but then therefore you cannot assess a patient based on this, based uh, on a value directly. It, uh, you, you need to look at the patient and evaluate in a different way, not looking at the creatinine value and assessing the patient. It is a spectrum. Kidney injury is a spectrum. Uh, and therefore you find it in a, a normal patient on the table, undergoing surgery, could suffer a, any risk factor like hypotension, he could have diabetes. And therefore there are several risk factors. Oh, those risk factors in a normal patient, in otherwise normal patient could reduce the GFR and then there is injury and then the kidney failure and ultimately death. So our aim is to detect acute renal failure during the early stages of the spectrum. Once the injury has occurred, when the serum creatinine has started elevation, is increasing, and then you diagnose it as acute kidney injury, then the time is, uh, has elapsed a lot. So we need to, need to find out something which uh, will help us in diagnosing acute renal shutdown or renal failure in the early stages, acute kidney injury in the early stage and not late. So is it relevant to us? Is it significant? Should we bother about it? Yes, it is a common serious problem. We need to really worry about it because the consequences of perioperative acute kidney injury is very, very serious. The incidence is quite high. It is five to seven person. Meaning if you look at the total number of patients getting admitted in the hospital, it's a huge number. Seven percent is a huge number. It occurs in 5% of the population who undergo surgery. Talking about cardiac surgery, the incidence is very high, 30%. It has high morbidity, hospitalization is prolonged, high cost is involved, and the mortality is also very high. And therefore, it is a very, very significant problem. And one need to look at it as we look at the cardiac problems, as we look at the respiratory problems, uh, we also need to look at the kidney problems. Who is at risk? Now, if you look at the risk factors, they are all overlapping. So we have a patient, see, with cardio, cardiac problem, with hepatic, metabolic, maybe in his 70s or patient, that patient may be obese. The same patient would have a fall in uh, perfusion. He must be having anemia. He must be on a nephrotoxic drug. And that surgery would have been a long, prolonged surgery. So all these factors are interlinked or overlapping. And therefore, you can, your patient can suffer uh, acute kidney uh, injury during the perioperative period. So what are the risks? There is any risk index uh, which has been proposed. There are several risk factors like age above 56 years, male sex, congestive, congestive cardiac failure, ascites, hypertension, emergency surgery, intraperitoneal surgery, renal insufficiency, and diabetes management. These are all the risk factors which we very often see in the operation rooms during the perioperative period. And these, uh, based on these risk factors, there are several, the, it has it is classified into one, two, three, four, and five. And the patient has more than six risk factors, the chances for developing acute kidney injury is more than 10%. So look at the, the number of risk factors in, your given, in the given patient, and you can say 
roughly that how important it is to uh, take care of the patient during the perioperative period. Coming to the, the incidents, uh, what could we do to prevent the, the incidence of acute kidney injury? Can we really prevent it? Uh, there is the treatment uh, aspect is very, uh, is not very much evolved. We need to prevent the disease before it occurs. So what should we do? Uh, careful and thoughtful preoperative assessment. This is extremely important. We evaluate the patient, look at the risk factors. If the patient is diabetic, the patient has many, is there any other problem related uh, and which adds to the risk factors. Uh, and during the perioperative period, intraoperative hemodynamic optimization, and the BP fault that could be reduced, uh, renal flow, and then minimize exposure to nephrotoxin. Simple drugs like uh, NSIDs can produce renal problem and manage post-operative complications. So you, we can do a lot to prevent the occurrence of uh, acute kidney injury during the perioperative period. Uh, what else can we do? Intraoperative hemodynamic optimization. How do we do it? Mean, maintaining intravascular volume. Too much is bad, too little is, is also bad. So maintain mean arterial pressure, pressure in auto-regulation range. I'll come to it later on. Uh, anticipation of hemodynamic disturbances. If the patient is going to bleed, see that doesn't uh, drop the BP uh, on the table, get your blood ready for transfusion. Uh, maintain urine output to more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. There is again, though there are some uh, problems in doing that because uh, it usually reduces during the perioperative period. And finally, the, the glycemic control. Uh, several studies have shown that glycemic control can do a lot for prevention of acute kidney injury. This is coming to auto, uh, renal autoregulation. You can see the normal uh, autoregulation uh, curve here. Uh, the renal perfusion pressure is maintained within normal range despite wide fluctuations in uh, mean arterial pressure. So between an arterial pressure of say 70 and 160, <clears throat> uh, 160 or 150, the renal perfusion pressure is maintained. But when it falls below that, when it falls below uh, 70 or 80, or when it goes above 150, then the renal perfusion pressure suffers. This, and this there is a rightward shift of the same curve in hypertensive patients. And therefore, in hypertensive patients, we have to maintain the perfusion pressure at a higher level and not as we maintain it in a normal individual. What about mean arterial pressure and fluids? Maintaining adequate mean arterial pressure is mandatory. We have to maintain the mean artery. It cannot go very low for long time, especially. Hypovolemia is well known, is a well-known risk factor for the, for the uh, production of acute kidney injury. And as well, volume overload is, overload is also a risk factor, and therefore we have to prevent both. Use of HES. HES Hydroxyethyl stars is currently contraindicated by international guidelines. And therefore, H, coming talking about fluids, H is contraindicated. And its place, human albumin may be used if you want to expand the volume in place of hydroxyethyl stars. And instead of 0.9% saline, one need to use physiological solution like the physiological crystalloid, balanced crystalloid solutions. 0.9% saline is also said to be bad for the nephrons. What could we do to prevent the incidence of acute kidney injury? Minimize exposure to nephrotoxins. Don't use NSIDs. Don't use AC inhibitors and uh, uh, receptor blocking drugs in cases you know, which uh, 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 do have some other risk factors. So avoid using such nephrotoxic drugs. Uh, don't use radio contrast, uh, radiograph contrast in patients who have other risk factors or if you use it, uh, use it very judiciously. Aminoglycoside and quinolins and also penicillins are also nephrotoxic and be careful. 
chemotherapeutic agents are also nephrotoxic and one need to be very careful about that also so one need to use these drugs very judiciously in a patient who has other risk factors for the development of acute kidney injury this is again uh, one uh, area uh, a problem area uh, that is fluid fluid overload fluids uh, we should understand that fluids do not reverse vasodilatory hypotension uh, shock due to vasodilatation uh, you cannot give fluids alone it causes organ and tissue edema if you give too much of fluid in such situations it produces edema tissue edema it causes uh, venous congestion and therefore it worsens tissue perfusion and produces what is called as the intra abdominal pressure and therefore <clears throat> the kidico recommends uh, use of vasopressors in conjunction with fluids in patients with vaso water shock uh, or at risk for acute kidney injury so you need to use a combination of fluids and the vasopressor if you have a patient with so there is a kidico recommendation for treating patients who are uh, who are hypovolemic due to a shock what are the renal effects of increased intra abdominal pressure when the intra abdominal pressure increases it increases about 35 to 60% uh, when it increases there is a decrease in uh, renal blood flow by about 35 to 60% uh, and therefore it is not a good thing especially when you produce pneumoperitoneum during laparoscopic surgeries when you inflate the stomach there is of course there is an decrease in <clears throat> renal uh, blood flow a decrease in your blood flow will increase adh secretion increase it will increase plasma renin activity and also serum aldosterone and therefore it produces oliguria there is a normal physiological phenomenon the extent of oliguria oliguria is directly related to the increase in intra, intra abdominal pressure and studies have also shown an improvement with desufflation of the intra abdominal pressure so unnecessary increase in intraabdominal especially in patients who are at uh, risk for developing acute kidney injury one has to be careful uh, while <clears throat> you create while we create pneumoperitoneum so be cautious in patients with pre existing renal impairment especially if high intraabdominal pressure is used coming about uh, talking about auto regulation this is a glomeruli it has an afferent arteriole and an efferent arteriole afferent arteriole vasoconstriction decreases gfr when it gas vasoconstrict it decreases gfr the efferent arteriole when it vasoconstricts it increases gfr uh, that is uh, we all know about it. it is a physiology it is physiology and nothing uh, important the, so uh, the next slide would show what happens if a drug is used see this is again a glomerulus it has got an efferent arteriole and also an efferent arteriole when you use nsaids it will act on the prostaglandins and it it, it, it is a determined uh, by inhibiting prostaglandin production nsaids can cause efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction and reduce gfr and that is the reason we say nsaids are not good in patients who have other risk factors for the development of acute kidney injury similarly on the other end the efferent arteriole ac inhibitors and arbs are not very good because they act on the angiotensin 2 and norepinephrine and produces vasodilatation uh, and then they produces a reduce in uh, gfr so both the, the, the they act some of the drugs act on the efferent arterioles and uh, some of the drugs act on the efferent arterioles by producing uh, or worsening kidney injury so having talked uh, that much about the physiology and some of the risk factors and what are the uh, and some of the definitions let me now uh, move on to uh, the uh, drugs which can help us in preventing the development of acute kidney injury during the perioperative period do we have any drug to prevent the development of acute kidney injury let us see one by one so we'll talk about dopamine 
low, low diuretics, diuretics like uh, frosamide, atrial natriuretic peptide, phenoldepam, mesylite, and N-acetyl cysteine. These are the drugs which I'm going to talk to you very briefly uh, uh, with regard to prevention of acute kidney injury. Perioperative oliguria is an important clinical marker, but it is not renal specific. Just because a patient has reduced urine output doesn't mean that the patient is suffering from acute kidney injury. Perioperative oliguria is very common during the perioperative period. Oliguria is a physiologic response of functioning kidneys during perioperative setting. And that just because the patient has reduced urine, you cannot say that patient is suffering from acute kidney injury. So absence of oliguria does not exclude acute kidney injury. That we have to understand. So number, the, talking about the first drug, there is dopamine, the renal dose. Dopamine has three actions at very low levels, at up to three micrograms per kilogram body weight per minute. It produces renal vasodilatation by acting on the dopaminergic uh, receptors. So that is said to be, we have been um, extensively using dopamine because of that action. And higher doses, uh, up to five to six micrograms per kilogram per body weight per minute, it produces beta effect and still higher doses, uh, around 10 micrograms per kilogram uh, body weight per minute, it produces alpha effect. So when you use it in the very low uh, uh, levels, uh, doses, it is said to be advantages, it will be beneficial for the kidneys, but that has been, uh, several studies have shown that is not uh, correct. These effects are attributable to its action, not its action on renal hemodynamics, but mainly because of its action on the cardiac output and not because of the dopaminergic receptor stimulation. So uh, the cardiac output actions are the main thing uh, the reason for producing the increased urine output. Studies have not demonstrated any benefits, uh, beneficial effects, uh, and its use as a first-line inotropic uh, has been uh, condemned by several studies. It is not used as a vasopressor uh, of choice uh, for control for increasing uh, renal uh, output, renal flow, blood flow uh, in patients at risk. So dopamine is not used these days. It has been used extensively in the past, but now the study says it is of no use. Coming to frosamide, a loop diuretic, is it renoprotective? It is also not renoprotective. It can be harmful sometimes by worsening established acute kidney injuries. And an established person, acute kidney injury person, the use of uh, loop diuretic frosamide can be harmful. There is no evidence of incidence reduction and no statics prove uh, that it is useful in acute kidney injury uh, and, and therefore it is not usually recommended these days. The kidney ego do not recommend except in the management of all volume overload. If the patient is volume overloaded, then, then fine, one can use it and go ahead and use it, but not for the prevention of acute kidney injury. Coming to phenoldepam, the new drug, uh, which we do not use very routinely, is again a selective D1 dopamine receptor agonist. It is a renal vasodilator. Again, studies show that it is of no use. The current evidence does not support the use of uh, phenoldepam, uh, mainly because of its hypotensive effect. There is still room for future investigations and uh, clinical trials are ongoing to find out more about the phenoldepam uh, use in patients with renal problems. What about atrial natriuretic peptide? Is it uh, being used these days? No, it's again a no, great no. Produce is produced by cardiac atria in response to atrial dilatation. It is an endogenous uh, diuretic and no studies have proved that it is renoprotective. The ANP induced systemic hypotension is in fact uh, detrimental to the kidneys and therefore ANP is also out of question. What about N-acetylcysteine? We do use it. Is it useful? It's again, is an antioxidant. It is a free radical scavenging uh, drug. 
uh, it is it has showed controversial effects. It is of some benefit in patients with contrast induced acute kidney injury and such situations uh, people use it, uh, but otherwise it is not used. It produces anaphylactic and anaphylactoid reactions. And therefore, we have not found a suitable drug which can be safely used in acute kidney injury to prevent the occurrence of acute kidney injury. So we cannot use dopamine to prevent, we cannot use phenoldapam to prevent, we cannot use atrial natriuretic peptide to prevent, treat kidney injury. They are all studied well and they have proved to be of no use in acute kidney injury. And what do we do? We have only one method to do it, that is prevention. Risk identification and uh, proper care of the patient, proper vigilance, that is all we can do. Prevent uh, hemodynamic uh, problems during the perioperative period and don't use nephrotoxic. These are the things which one can do to prevent the occurrence of acute kidney injury during the perioperative period. Now I'll talk something about the biomarkers of uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, these are something which are coming up uh, these days, but they are not in clinical use uh, in most of the countries in, in Europe and some places being used, but not uh, routinely used, quite expensive. But in India, it is never used these days. It is not at all used these days. Maybe it requires more uh, research work and uh, studies. So what are its uses? It is used for acute kidney injury uh, because uh, when the serum creatinine increases, uh, which is a current gold standard, uh, the kidney damage has already occurred. Most of the, more than 50% of the kidney has suffered acute kidney injury for the creatinine to be present in the plasma. And therefore, creatinine is not a, it is not a very useful uh, uh, marker for the uh, identification of acute kidney injury. It widely varies also with age, with a gen gender, with diet, muscle mass, muscle metabolism, medications, and hydration status. So if you have a patient who is emaciated with very little muscle mass, say a patient above 75 years or 70 years with, who is emaciated, um, in him, the creatinine value may be normal, but he may be suffering from acute kidney injury. Uh, so you cannot rely on the serum creatinine. And most all the definitions we use are based on serum creatinine. And therefore, it is not a uh, is not very specific uh, for to identify acute kidney injury. So up to 50% of kidney function may be lost before serum creatinine even begins to rise. So uh, we spot the patient only when 50% of the kidney has failed. And therefore, it is not of much use, actually. So coming back to the staging of acute kidney, the spectrum of acute kidney injury, uh, we have already talked about that uh, with no kidney disease to subclinical acute kidney injury to kidney injury stage 1, 2, 3, and kidney failure. So it's a spectrum. So when it reaches acute kidney injury, the serum creatinine rises. But do we have anything, any marker to identify kidney injury during the early stage? That is when the subclinical acute kidney injury occurs. That is the question. Do we have? We do have it, but we don't use it in clinical practice. It takes time before we get uh, that to be used in the clinical practice. So there are very, these are the common acute kidney injury uh, uh, risk factors, which I've already uh, talked in the beginning of the lecture, uh, the septic acute kidney injury, hypovolemia, post-surgery acute, and uh, so on and so forth. And the risk of complication um, is a spectrum showing risk of complication, non-recovery, mortality, and healthcare cost. So, and we, these markers, creatinine and urine output are late markers of acute kidney injury and that they are of not much use actually uh, for the protection of kidneys. Coming back again to my markers, these are the times, 0, 12, 24, and 36 hours. 
and lower down is a pre-renal insult and the acute tubular necrosis. If you have, if you have to have something, we should have a biomarker which can be identified during the first 24 hours. When the serum creatinine starts elevating, it is beyond 48 hours. So uh, what do we have? We'll see. Because when we can identify, identify acute kidney injury in the early period, then there is a window of opportunity. We have got something to do there. Uh, we can be more cautious. We can be more judicious in uh, protecting the kidney if you have uh, something during that you know, period. So these are the four commonly used biomarkers for research purpose. The NGAL or the neutrophil gelatinase associate lipokaline, KIM1 or the kidney injury molecule 1, cystatin C, and the last IL-18 interleukin-18. There are several others, almost more than 50, and these are peculiar to different parts of the nephrons. Some will increase when the glomerulus are disturbed. Some will increase when the ascending and descending loops are disturbed and so forth. So if we have these biomarkers uh, in common use, we can identify where the damage is taking place, whether it's taking place in the medulla or in the cortex. So NG, NGAL, it is elevated during the first three to six hours and up to 24 hours. It starts elevating during the six, the first few hours, and then, of course, it uh, remains there for 24 hours. The KIM-1 is the next one, the biomarker which uh, gets elevated. The last is cysteine, and the last is the creatinine after 48 hours. So the great damage has been done once we get the creatinine. So this is a thera therapeutic window, and if we have, can find out this NGAL uh, elevation, then it would be the best to spot uh, acute kidney injury in the very, very early stage. So biomarkers are useful for early prediction and diagnosis of acute kidney injury. You can identify the site of injury because each biomarker is specific to a part of the nephron. You can identify the etiology of acute kidney injury. You can also monitor the response to intervention and treatment and also predict the outcome. So biomarkers are going to be the thing in the future. So if you have an elevated biomarker, then we can avoid and treat hypotension. We have no drugs available to prevent the formation of acute kidney disease. So avoid and treat hypotension, avoid and treat hypovolemia, avoid and treat oliguria, avoid contrast agents, avoid nephrotoxic medication. These are the things which one could do to prevent the uh, occurrence of acute kidney injury uh, during the perioperative period. So the take home points uh, would be, any degree of acute kidney injury produces worse out outcome. An apparently successful surgical outcome may not mean a successful renal outcome. Patient would look normally externally, clinically, but the kidneys would have already suffered Careful and thoughtful preoperative assessment is extremely important. Identify the risk factors and act accordingly. Management of acute kidney injury centers on optimizing fluid status, optimizing blood pressure, treating sepsis, and removing nephrotoxic agents. The routine administration of low dose dopamine to patients for the uh, prevention of acute kidney injury is uh, of no use. It is not recommended by the key digo. Diuretics and low dose dopamine, no substitute for hydration is again not used. Biomarkers are the future to screen patients for acute kidney injury prior to an actual increase in serum creatinine. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent talk. You have mentioned about the biomarkers very well. And also, the take-home message was very good. And now we will see a few questions are there in the chat box. You can see the chat box. Sir. OK, OK, OK. Sir, I should read, sir. 
What is the role of manitol? A role of manitol in a kid. That is the only question that has been asked. Yeah. Manitol again is uh, has been studied uh, very extensively, and uh, it has not been found to be very useful in um, preventing the formation of acute kidney injury, from the occurrence of acute kidney injury. But it is anyway superior to frozamide in renal transplant surgeries because uh, it is not that harmful. That is the uh, some of the studies uh, do recommend using mannitol in place of uh, frozamide in in the during the uh, when we use. Uh, but and this for the same reason in cardiac surgeries, mannitol is uh, being used with the priming solution, uh, with the hope of preventing acute kidney injury. But again, that is there are several studies uh, showing that it is of no use. In spite of that, we still use mannitol, um, hoping that it prevents acute kidney injury. I think, sir, not only to prevent the acute kidney injury, it, it will prevent the edema of the patient. Maybe that's why we are using common. Indications could be yeah, different. Okay. Um, the myomarkers, do they appear in the urine? No, they, these are actually blood investigations. They don't appear in the urine. Uh, that is what, uh, but this clinically it has not been used. Um, so I do not know exactly how it is uh, being done. Uh, it's only if, of research and uh, clinical purpose is being used. Uh, research and uh, trial purpose it has been in case of Whipple surgery or hepatic resection, instead of HES, can we straight away start albumin to restrict crystalloids? Albumin is albumin is a better choice. The only prohibiting thing is the cost of albumin. Otherwise, albumin is a better choice if you want to use uh, a volume expander. It is a good choice, but again, it's quite expensive. Now, if there is any questions from the audience, they can unmute and ask you, sir. Is it? Madam, anything else to ask? Madam? Hello? Yeah, yes. Irfan. Dr. Irfan, you can ask. Mm. Hello, good evening, sir. So good evening, Irfan. Sir, I am a senior resident uh, from Skims, Srinagar. Okay. Sir, I have a question. Suppose we have uh, sometimes patients in our ICUs, uh, they are in sepsis or septic shock, uh, having that diffuse capillary syndrome uh, type of picture. Okay. Uh, so with then they also present with AKI. Okay. So my question is, uh, what's the what's the fluid uh, like uh, we can use there? Is it normal saline? Is it like uh, balance the saw solution. So, can you, sir, please? It is, it is the, the recommend. The current recommendation is to use balanced salt solution because sodium chloride is uh, detrimental to the nephrons. High sodium levels and chloride levels, they are not, uh, and therefore, uh, sodium chloride should never be used. Uh, and the recommendation is to use balanced salt solution. And again, SC is also contraindicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, if there is no more questions, we will move on to our next session, that is PG Corner. Okay. Yeah. So today we have Dr. Najita and Dr. Adira, residents from uh, Astrum Ames, Calicut. And uh, to coordinate the session, I welcome Dr. Kishore. HOD and Senior Consultant of Department of Anesthesia, Astro Mims Calicut. Over to Dr. Kishore. Sir, please. Thank you, Minil. <clears throat> can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me, Minil? You are audible. You are audible, sir. And the screen okay, is thanks, visible. Thanks, Minil. Uh, um, uh, good evening, all. Um, Dr. Najida and uh, Dr. Adira are our DNB trainees. And uh, then uh, talking about two, one drug and one equipment. Prochronum is the uh, muscle uh, license. And it has um, shown interest in, in recent past because of the advent of 
uh, sugmodex and uh, because he can see like he can reverse it instantly so roplin has shown a keen interest in use uh, in nowadays and uh, the other equipment topic is uh, about pulse oximeter everybody knows that uh, one equipment which has uh, sort of saved many lives and this uh, one of the main uh, campaign in wh of saving lives safe surgery save lives the pulse oximeter distribution pulse oximeter every place where they don't have is this is one of the key elements so uh, let's hear from dr najida about ofranum and uh, dr adira about pulse oximeter over to you Uh, am i audible sir yeah uh, good evening all i'm dr najida from astimim calicut and uh, today i'm going to discuss about rocuronium <coughs> rocuronium is the drug acting on the neuromuscular junction causing skeletal muscle paralysis it is introduced in 1994 it is a synthetic non depolarizing muscle relaxant and it is a rapidly acting amino steroid with intermediate duration of action it is the first non depolarizing drug considered to be a replacement for succinylcholine which is a de- known as is succinylcholine which is a depolarizing muscle relaxant with short onset of action and short duration of action with this uh, undesirable side effects uh, structurally it belongs to amino steroid group Uh, and it is related to another amino steroid vicuronium it is faster acting and less potent compared with vicuronium and uh, it is a monocotinary neuromuscular blocking drug positively charged and relatively large mo- molecule uh, this is the uh, structure of an amino steroid uh, at the r1 and r2 position it, uh, rocuronium has non piperidine group which makes it faster onset of action and uh, at the r3 position uh, nitrogen is attached to the allyl group uh, instead of methyl group as in uh, vicuronium which makes it less potent compared with vicuronium that is it is six times less potent compared with vicuronium Uh, coming to preparations uh, strength is 10 mg per ml available as 5 ml t- 10 ml vials it is a colorless clear solution stored at 2 to 8 degrees celsius it should not freeze and it is administered as intravenous route uh, also some uh, intramuscular route is also reported in pediatric population coming to the principles of action this is a non depolarizing muscle relaxant Uh, rocuronium compete with uh, acetylcholine to bind to bind at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors nicotinic acetylcholine receptor as seen in figure it is a pentameric complex consists of two alpha subunits epsilon beta and delta subunits the acetylcholine binds to the al- al- two alpha subunits when it bind occupied by two alpha subunits it causes the opening of ion channels and causes the depolarization Rocuronium blocks the uh, bind to the alpha subunits, and when it is one of the alpha subunits is occupied by the rocu- rocuronium, it won't open and causes the uh, inhibit the depolarization. Coming to the pharmacokinetics of the drug, it is thirty percent is protein bound. Volume of distribution is about zero point two liter per kilogram. It doesn't cross placenta or blood brain barrier. since it is a quaternary compound uh, it has no active metabolites in body it is eliminated by uh, liver through bile excretion and 10 percentage in urine so long duration of action is uh, action of rocuronium occurs in hepatobiliary diseases coming to clinical uses uh, rocuronium facilitate the tracheal intubation Uh, in elective and emergency situation it is used for rapid tracheal intubation with the uh, higher do- doses uh, that is 0.9 to 1.2 mg per kg it provides optimal surgical conditions uh, like gastro surgery robotic and other surgeries uh, it causes chest wall relaxation to facilitate mechanical ventilation in icu in critically ill patient and uh, it is it can also be given as defecipitating dose when we are do, uh, using uh, succinylcholine as relaxant for muscle paralysis uh, that uh, one tenth of the ed95 dose is given to prevent shivering in post cardiac resuscitation after 
recovery of spontaneous circulation during therapeutic hypothermia. Coming to the dose, uh, ED95 dose is 0.3 mg per kg, that is, uh, it causes 95% twitch uh, depolarization, 95% reduction in twitch depolarization. Uh, the intubating dose is uh, two times the uh, ED95 dose, that is 0.6 to uh, 1.2 mg per kg. Uh, when we are using 0.6 mg per kg, the onset of action occurs in 85 to 95 seconds. Duration of action is about uh, 36 minutes. Uh, maintenance dose is 0.1 mg per kg uh, with duration 12 to 17 minutes. Uh, we can use as uh, 9 to 12 infusion at a rate of uh, 9 to 12 mg per kg per minute. Uh, it is 6 to 10 times less potent compared with vicuronium and pancuronium. Coming to the effects, uh, it's, uh, it has minimal effects on uh, central uh, cardiovascular system with large doses uh, because of its minimal vagolytic action. And in respiratory system, uh, since it is a neuromuscular blocker, it causes apnea and uh, it, it doesn't release the histamine as compared with other neuromuscular blocking drugs like atracurem or Coming to large dose regimen for RSI. Procuronium is uh, used for RSI at four times the endu uh, ED95 dose that is 1.2 mg per kg. So intubating condition is uh, attained at 55 seconds with uh, long duration of action that is duration of action is 75 minutes. Uh, adverse reaction uh, in anesthesia the most common adverse reactions are seen with neuromuscular blocking drugs the main culprits are uh, rocuronium and saxamethonium fatal anaphylacoid re reactions are reported associated with rocuronium and it has a vagolytic action in higher doses it causes increasing heart rate and increase in MAP coming to reversal it is a uh, drug having specific uh, antidote uh, that is Sugamadex. It can reverse rocuronium and vicuronium. Sugamadex has a lipophilic uh, inner core which encapsulates the uh, rocuronium in its uh, cyclodextrin cavity and it is used as 4 mg per kg doses IV when we use 0.6 mg per kg and when we are used higher doses that is uh, in the case of uh, do not intubate do not ventilate conditions you can rescue reversal dose can be used that is 16 mg per kg as seen in this figure rocuronium is uh, encouraged by the sugamadex and causes a um, uh, hide water soluble compound and excre excreted through kidney thank you Shall we move to the next topic? Yes, sir. Yes. So we can discuss this topic also. Anything? Any any questions or any? We don't have any questions in the chat box. No, nothing is seen. Oh, someone asked about uh, what is the IM dose of Procuronium? Has anyone used? Uh, that is... And the dose, I don't remember. The onset of action will, uh, we can intubate after 3 to 10 minutes after IM dose in pediatric population. I'm not aware of it.
So we don't have any other questions I put in the chat box. So, uh, we can go to the next one, Pulp Sox Sumita. Hello? Yes. Please. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Good evening to one and all. I'm Dr. Adhira Anil from Astronomy Calicut. I'm here to present the topic Pulse Oximetry. Pulse Oximetry is a simple non Slide, slide. Yes, sir. Do one thing and stop sharing. Yes. Now you can share your slide. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Pulse oximetry is a simple, non-invasive, continuous, uh, continuous method of measuring arterial oxygen saturation in patients of all age group, and thus it provides a measure of cardiopulmonary function. It is often called as the fifth vital sign. History. In 1935, Carl Mathis was the first man to develop a two-wavelength tear oxygen saturation meter. In 1940, Glenn Milliken coined the term oximeter. 1972, Takoi Ayogi, a Japanese bioengineer, invented the principles of pulse oximeter which we use today. Uh, this is the ear, ear oximeter OLV5100 developed by Takoi Ayogi. In 1995, Massimo introduced signal extraction technology which overcomes the limitations of uh, the newer, newer pulse oximeter. In 2008, high resolution pulse oximetry came into existence. Uh, until 1980, cubosum ear oximeters were used, whereas the modern pulse oximeter is smaller and easy to handle. Pulse oximeter uses two LEDs, a red LED and an infrared LED. The light passes through the tissue and the transmitted light intensity is detected by the photo detector and the microprocessor analyzes the data and gives us a saturation. Operating principle, Pulse oximeter combines the principles of spectrophotometry and plethysmography. Spectrophotometry measures the hemoglobin saturation and plethysmography measures the pulsatile changes at the uh, blood volume. All atoms and molecules absorb specific wavelength of light. This property is the basis of spectrophotometry. The pulse oximeter estimates SpO2 from differential absorption of light by hemoglobin. The deoxyhemoglobin uh, absorbs red light of 660 nanometer and oxyhemoglobin absorbs near infrared light of 940 nanometer. Uh, spectrometry is based on Beer Lambert's law, which describes the absorption of monochromatic light. Beer's law states that the intensity of transmitted light decreases exponentially as the concentration of substance increases. And Lambert law states that the intensity of transmitted light decreases exponentially as the distance traveled to the substance increases. So combining the two laws, we can get the equation as IE is equal to I0 into E raised to minus DCA, where D is the distance traveled, uh, A, uh, C is the concentration of substance, A is the extension coefficient. The next uh, principle is plethysmography, which measures the volume change from the fluctuation in the amount of blood or air within an organ. Pulse oximeter need to analyze only the arterial blood, ignoring the other tissues. So we use the principles of plethysmography. Uh, absorption of light passing through the tissue is characterized by two components. The first one is the pulsatile or AC component, which is due to the absorption of light by the pulsatile arterial blood and the non-pulsatile DC component, which includes the absorption of light by non-pulsatile arterial blood, venous blood, capillary blood, other tissues, bones and pigments. Uh, the um, uh, the ratio of reddish to infrared uh, light ratio of the pulsatile component is used to compute the oximetry reading. The microprocessor first analyzes the uh, DC AC component and it is divided to, with the DC component. The graph, uh, the graph is plotted about this uh, with uh, saturation and reddish to infrared ratio. The measured ratio is uh, uh, calculated with the stored ratio and the uh, saturation is displayed. 
Moving on to types of pulse oximeter, there are mainly two types of pulse oximeter which include transmission pulse oximeter. In this, the LED and photo detector are placed in the opposite side and the light is transmitted through the tissue. This is the most commonly used. The next one is the reflectance pulse oximeter where LED and the photo detectors are on the same side. The light is reflected from the emitter to the detector. The advantage is that we can, can overcome the problem of signal transmission during hyperperfusion. Some of the examples are cerebral oximeter, gastric mucosal SpO2 cross. So here we can see in the transmissive uh, pulse oximeter, LED and detectors are on the opposite side and light is transmitted. And in reflective, LED and detectors are on the same side, the light is reflected. Equipments, uh, pulse oximeters are available as probes, cables, consoles. Sites, the most common site is fingertip. Other sites include wrist, palms and soles and neonates. Uh, these are the other safe flexible probes used. The penis in neonates, ear, nose and forehead. Ear and ear, nose and forehead respond rapidly to the changes in saturation. So they, they are uh, less uh, affected by the vasoconstrictive effect of sympathetic system. So they can be better uh, reliable during hypothermia and hypotension. The disadvantages is that they are unreliable during the redolent by position due to venous congestion. Outputs from the pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter provides SpO2 value, waveform, and audible intensity. Uh, all pulse oximeter emits a beep sound after detecting a plethysmographic pulse, which coincides with the heartbeat. The pitch of the beep is proportional to SpO2. The audible pitch intensity alerts the changes in SpO2 even if the digital value is away from the visual sight. This is a pulse co-oximeter where in addition to oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, it also measures carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin. The other values which we get are uh, pulse rate, uh, plethysmograph variability index, this is the uh, graph waveform. So the conventional pulse oximeter measures functional saturation, which is a ratio of oxyhemoglobin to oxygen plus oxy plus deoxyhemoglobin. Whereas the co-oximeter co measures fractional saturation. This is the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to the all the four adult hemoglobin, that is oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and carboxyhemoglobin. Moving on to the uses of pulse oximeter, it can be used to monitor oxygenation in our uh, operation theaters, post anesthetic care unit, uh, newborn suits, delivery suits uh, for transportation of the patient and home care patients. It can, uh, it can be used for prevention of hyperoxia in uh, intrapartum fetal monitoring to monitor the peripheral circulation, to monitor vascular volume and sympathetic tone. Perfusion index and plethysmograph variability index. Perfusion index is a ratio of pulsatile to non-pulsatile blood flow in peripheral tissue. So it represents a non-invasive measure of peripheral perfusion. The PI value ranges from 0, 0 0.02 to 20 percentage. And plet variability index is a measure of dynamic changes in perfusion index that occurs during respiratory cycle. So here is a saturation probe with uh, perfusion index and plet variability index also displayed. Uh, uh, perfusion index uh, is an early indicator of successful anesthesia administration. We know that a general and regional anesthesia initiates a peripheral vasodilation even before the onset of anesthesia effect. So detection of a spike in the perfusion index is a sign of successful anesthesia onset. This helps in the pain management in patients who are unable to communicate. So an uh, increase in the spike of perfusion index can, be, uh, can estimate a successful epidural placement in labor patients, a caudal block in pediatric patients, a successful regional uh, nerve block. Other uses of perfusion index is it can estimate the volume status of in trauma patients, the restoration of peripheral perfusion after cardiopulmonary bypass. It, can, it is an indicator of circulatory function in re-implanted body parts. Moving on to the limitations, limitations can be broadly classified into two, safe limitations and potentially unsafe limitations. Safe limitations are those where the inaccuracies displayed in the SPO2 can be identified and its cause is recognizable. The, divert, the device uh, alerts us with an alarm. In the potentially unsafe limitations, the inaccuracy is difficult to recognize. The displayed SPO2 is incorrect, but there is no alarm or warning about the problem. Some of the safe limitations are motion artifacts, uh, poor perfusion, 
electromagnetic interference, nail polishes and covering, and irregular rhythm. Motion artifacts. Motion at the sensor site can uh, cause artifacts that the pulse oximeter is unable to differentiate it from the normal arterial pulsation. Uh, some causes of motion are uh, shivering, inhalation induction in children during the transportation of the patients, evoke potential monitors and nerve stimulators if the pulse oximeter is placed, in, placed on the same extremity, neonates with tiny digits and poor contacts. An erratic display of pulse rate, distorted plethysmographic wave, and increase in the pulse amplitude, we can recognize it is due to motion artifacts. So how can we correct this? We can use ear, cheek, or nose probes. They are better reliable than finger probes. Proper positioning of the sensor the, uh, in a different extremity. Other C flexible probes can be used. Use of the R wave in ECG to synchronize the optical measurements. Uh, use of pulse oximeter with newer technologies like Massimo signal extraction technology, where they can process the light signals and measure and subtract the noise, co noise component. Poor perfusion. A good pulse waveform is very essential for a pulse oximeter to calculate the ratio between the pulsatile and non-pulsatile absorptions. But in conditions like hypovolemia, hypotension, hypothermia, uh, BP of inflation, peripheral vascular disease and all, there is poor perfusion. So we get an erratic display of SpO2. So we can improve this by warming the extremities using a vasodilating cream, etc. Nail polishes and covering. All colors of nail polish affect the SpO2 reading. Black, purple and dark blue are, have the greatest effect. Synthetic nails, dirt under uh, nails, onychomycrosis, henna also can affect the pulse oximeter reading. Electromagnetic interference from the cautery can interfere the pulse oximeter. But this effect is transient and limited. To overcome the effect, the pulse oximeter sensor is kept far away from the surgical site and electrocautery ground plate. Irregular rhythms. During rapid atrial fibrillation, tachyarrhythmias, intra-arterial balloon pulsations, the pulse oximeter reading is unreliable. It is during IABP, the di uh, diastolic pressure augments more than the systolic pressure, leading to a double or triple wave arterial waveform. This confuses the pulse oximeter. Moving on to potential unsafe limitations, the first one is abnormal hemoglobins. Methemoglobin uh, approximates the SpO2 saturation to 85%. Uh, Whereas carboxy hemoglobin overreads the SpO2. But fetal hemoglobin and HBS do not have any interference in pulse oximeter. Carboxy hemoglobin. Normal carboxy hemoglobin levels are about 1%. Whereas in smokers, it raises to 10 to 20%. So from the graph, we can see that the absorption of red light by carboxy hemoglobin is similar to oxyhemoglobin. So the presence of a significant carboxy hemoglobin in blood will uh, uh, resemble the curve of an oxyhemoglobin in the red range with no effect in the infrared range. So this uh, uh, caused the pulse oximeter to overread. So for every one percentage of circulating oxy carboxy hemoglobin, the pulse oximeter overreads by one percentage. Methemoglobinemia occurs when the Fe2 plus the ferrous ion is oxidized to Fe3 plus. In this case, in the, from the graph, we can see that hem, uh, methemoglobin absorbs equal amount of red, red and infrared rate. So from the graph plotted, we can see that the reddest to infrared ratio is equal to 1 when the saturation is 85 percentage. So the methemoglobinemia causes the pulse oximeter to show a reading of 85 percentage, even if it is a hypoxic or hyperoxic condition. Probe positioning. Better uh, a probe should be properly positioned. Uh, otherwise, some light can project tangentially to the detector without crossing the arterial blood. And this effect is known as penumbra effect or optical shunting effect. Hyperemia. When a limb is hyperemic, the flow of the capillary and venous split also becomes pulsatile. And this will be also taken up for the saturation estimation, leading to an erratic blood, uh, uh, reading. Pressure on the sensor can also affect the pulse oximeter reading. Calibration assumptions. Calibration algorithms are derived by correlating arterial oxygen saturation in healthy volunteers over a range of saturation. As it is unethic unethical to desaturate to a level less than 80, uh, saturation of 80 percentage, lower SpO2 values are unreliable. There, will be, there is a difficulty in detecting high oxygen partial pressure difficulty in detecting hypoxia, 
failure to detect hypoventilation. Hypoventilation and hypercarbia may occur without a fall in SpO2, especially if the patient is receiving supplemental oxygen. So the pulse oximeter should not be relied on uh, to assess the adequacy of ventilation or to detect disconnection or esophageal intubation. Discrepancy in reading from different monitors. Delayed detection of hypoxia. Uh, the relation between SpO2 and PaO2 is calculated by the ODC curve. As we all know that the ODC curve is sigmoid, at higher saturation uh, oxygenation, the curve flattens. So at higher SpO2 cannot uh, discriminate between a normoxemic and hypo hypoxemic condition. So this is relevant when we attempt to limit the oxygen exposure in neonates or patients who are at the risk of oxygen toxicity. Uh, the second the thing is a small fall in SpO2 may cause a large drop in PaO2. So there is a delay in detection of hypoxia. Ambient light effect. Uh, ambient or room light is an unwanted noise. So uh, along with the LED, uh, red and infrared LED lights, uh, the detector also detected the ambient light. So for a good functioning, the strength of LED should be more than the ambient light falling on the detector. So these are some factors affecting the SpO2. Falsely high SpO2 by carboxyhemoglobin methemoglobin anemia. Low, uh, low saturation is given by prominent uh, uh, venous pulsation like tricuspid regurgitations. Intravenous dyes like methylene blue, indosanin green nail polishes, dark skin pigmentation, ambient light, motion artifacts, electromagnetic in interference, penumbra effect are the technical factors affecting the SpO2 reading. Whereas a hyperbilirubinemia, fetal hemoglobinemia, polycythemia and sulfhemoglobinemia do not affect the reading. The recent advances, uh, the recent advances, uh, we have multi-wavelength pulse oximeter, we have uh, developed a cerebral oximeter, the reflection pulse oximeter is used to monitor fetal SpO2 with scalp probes during labor, esophageal probes, gastric mucosal SpO2 probes. This is uh, the example of a cerebral pulse oximeter using near infrared uh, spectroscopy. Thank you. Thank you, Adira. Any comments? Or discuss the questions if, some, if there is some questions in the chat box. Otherwise, you can discuss the topics. Any questions or comments from the audience? Asit, there is no questions in the chat box. You sure? Yeah. I'm Dr. Shamshad. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. <laughs> uh, the, for rocronium, they have asked what is the dose of this rocronium for intramuscular injection? Uh, is it? That was the question. Is yes, it? Sir. Yeah, madam, it was there. <laughs> and uh, usually, uh, if we require uh, especially for infants and uh, children up to five years, can be given as intramuscular injection, either as gluteal or deltoid injection, if we don't have any uh, intravenous line. So in such case, the dose will be up to from 0 0.5, 0 0.8 to up to 2.5 milligram per kg. So uh, when we compare it with the saxamethonium, that can also be given as 3 to 4 milligram per kg. But saxamethonium produces much earlier relaxation than uh, rocuronium. And so um, uh, nowadays, I don't know where uh, anybody is using rocuronium as intramuscular injection. So that is the dose is, uh, it is given as not in our textbooks. Now, uh, Miller does not give us any dose of intramuscular injection. But some articles like PubMed is gives uh, like that. So uh, that is the dose up to 0 0.82 up to 2.4 milligram per kg can be given, especially in children, not in adults. And it will take a longer duration of action for producing complete endotracheal intubation, maximum relaxation. But saxamethonium uh, produces uh, relaxation, complete uh, relaxation for tracheal intubation in 
What is the importance of uh, amplitude of plethysmographic uh, graph? Is there an importance for the uh, amplitude of the graph? Uh, it shows about the uh, perfusion in index. Yeah, yeah. It... So if there is a spike in the perfusion in other words, what is the importance of uh, pleth variability index? Uh, uh, it shows the vasodilatory effect or peripheral perfusion. It directly indicates the peripheral perfusion of the patient. So during a respiration, the, the amplitude of the graph varies. And you can directly see the fluid response in that patient. Correct. Then one question in the chat box. Why is there false high FPO2 reading in severe anemia and no effect on polycythemia? So um, in sickle cell anemia, during the acute vaso-occlusive crisis, there will be overestimation of SpO2. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, in anemia, uh, there should not be any uh, effect in the SpO2 as the oxygen concentration, uh, the oxyhemoglobin and deoxy both are decreasing. One more question is there. What is the relationship between pulse oximeter and pulses paradoxes? How can dictate? I don't know, sir. Anybody can answer. No, I. Some start. Rajesh is not there, isn't it? Yeah, you sure you can answer pulse, pulses paradoxes as well as pulse oximeter. That's the entirely two different things. Yeah. I think even one who asked the question, he can explain the ah, question. He can, unmute and ask. <laughs> okay. he, can, he, he can unmute and ask the question in a detailed manner if he is there. 